Okay, okay. We're going to start off with a couple of uh, updates here from our missionaries, or a, 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 an update, I should say. Uh, Godfrey and Lana Watson are serving the Lord down in Jamaica. They are nationals there. And one of the ministries that they're carrying on right now in the COVID shutdown situation is care packages. And uh, in each of those little bags, they have uh, various food items as well as some toiletries. And so they're going out as much as they have money and capability of buying and just uh, taking these to people uh, in their church that are shut in and can't get out and have needs as well as people in the community. And uh, this is something that a number of our national pastors are doing. I know over in Africa, uh, down in Haiti, uh, Jamaica, Grenada, um, this is just a continual need in many of these countries. We are uh, blessed here in America. We have so many grocery stores. We may be out of toilet paper and uh, chicken shortage and meat and a few little things, but uh, we have uh, quite a bit of everything we need compared to what uh, these other countries have. So uh, we continue to pray for our, our nationals and our pastors as they're serving the Lord. Well, let's, let's begin with a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on the ministry of His Word today. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your love for us. Uh, we begin by saying thank You, thank You, thank You for sending Your Son, the Lord Jesus. You gave Your only begotten Son uh, to come to this earth and to die at the cross of Calvary on our behalf to be our Savior, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the ministry of the Spirit of God as we studied on Pentecost Sunday. We thank you, Father, for his wonderful ministries in our life, and particularly the fact that he, he drew us and opened our eyes and birthed us into the family of God. Thank you for his great ministries in our lives. And we just pray, Lord, even now this morning as we open your word and study again that your Spirit would uh, give us understanding, not only just give us understanding, Lord, but that he would give us a heart to obey and to practice what we learn in your word. Uh, may we be people that are uh, teachable and that are eager to live and serve for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning I want to talk about picking your poison. Picking your poison. Hemlock, arsenic, cyanide, strychnine, COVID, you name it, pick your poison. Talk about risk and dangers. There's a lot of risks and dangers in this world, and uh, we have to pick and choose maybe which, which ones we're going to hopefully not drink the poison, but, but we're going to have to pick some of the dangers. All of life is really about risk. Uh, COVID... 19, obviously, has posed a risk to people's health and life. And to consequently came the shutdown. And that posed tremendous risks and dangers to people's lives. And then with the reopening, as things are slowly opening up here in New York, uh, the pause is lifted, the quarantines are lifted, uh, soon the churches will be open to more than 10 people, and uh, then there will be renewed fears about the coronavirus again and will there be a resurgence or should we be fearing that again and so all of life is about measuring risks of some kind and and uh, having to decide is it worth it and so I want to talk about picking your poison this morning mm -hmm. there is risks and consequences and dangers involved in the coronavirus and even as we talk about all this it is good to know that there is one who sits on the throne. There is one Lord God who is in control and his name is not Cuomo. <laughs> He's Lord Jehovah, the almighty and living God, the creator and sustainer of the universe. I would also remind you that the statistics you read in the papers and you see in the news, they're misleading, usually inaccurate, and they're biased. So be careful of all statistics. I'm going to give you some statistics this morning. Be wary. They come from my perspective, okay? I think it's more of a biblical balanced perspective, but all statistics can be thwarted and changed and twisted. So be careful. 
Also, I would have you remember that the news, whether it be the printed newspapers or news on radio or television, news companies, corporations, are not, they are not in the business of proclaiming truth. That's not what they're in the business for. News agencies are in the business of making money. They're corporations. Uh, they need to gain viewership or readership. They need to sell newspapers. They need to sell advertising. They need to stay in business and make money. That's what they're there for. Consequently, every statistic they put forth is going to be a, a dramatized somehow. Every fact is going to be set in a light that's dramatic. and They have to turn everything, every story into a train wreck. So you'll keep watching, so you'll keep reading, so you'll keep buying the magazines. That's what news agencies are in the business for. I would encourage you, if they're bringing fear and anxiety to your life, shut the TV off. Don't listen, don't read it. Because a lot of it is, most all of it, is bias uh, and inaccurate. And it's designed to sensationalize, dramatize, uh, and sell. Okay? So be careful with those things. Is there risks and consequences, danger, health-wise, with the COVID virus? Certainly there is. There's a, a, a chance that people will get infected with it. And those who do get infected, the majority won't have any symptoms. There'll be some who have some minor symptoms. Then there'll be relatively few that have severe symptoms. And there's a minuscule amount of people who actually get hospitalized and may even die. There is a risk involved. And so we have to take this matter seriously. There is a risk. The risks, if you want to put them in statistics, for those who have COVID, healthy people under the age of 41 who have COVID, their chances of dying are the same as anybody who gets a smallpox vaccination. Just a routine smallpox vaccination. Complications with that. That's for people 41 and under, younger people. It, it, it just very, very, very small risk of death. But what if we don't shut down? Well, if we didn't shut down, there's risks too. Sweden didn't shut down. And so you could take and look and say, well, look how many people there have died. Now, uh, I think as of last night, we were at uh, 311,000. Or is it 111,000? 111,000 here in the United States. Uh, Sweden has 4,000 and some deaths. Obviously, we're a larger country. If we took the morbidity rate, the death rate, of the population of Sweden without a lockdown, and you put that onto America to sort of say, what would America be if we hadn't shut down? Our 111,000 deaths would come to about 130 to 140,000 deaths. Yeah, if we had no shutdown, there may be an increase of 30 to 40,000 more deaths in America. So yeah, if we didn't shut down, there'd be a risk of more deaths. Now that doesn't take into account that we have a lot better medical facilities or doctors and nurses and medicines and insurances and stuff, but we don't know, but that's just a guess. Well, what about the risks and consequences? Because we've shut down. You know, people say, we should have shut down. Or we should have reopened two months ago. Well, there would have been risks involved in that, of shutting down or not shutting down, or opening up too soon. But because we did shut down and it's gone for a couple months now, what are the risks of that? It's not just a matter of yeah. finances. It's a matter of people's health and lives. Let me just go over some of the consequences because of the shutdown. Not because of the virus, because of the shutdown. Millions of people are losing health care coverage. 50% of the people in our country have their health insurance through their employers. 50%. As of uh, about a month ago, there were 34 million people who got laid off. They estimate that that could go up to 47 million. Well, let's just stick with the 
30 some million that already were laid off. They lose their health insurance. Now some of those can qualify for Medicare, Medicaid. Some of them can continue paying their employee insurance with higher out-of-pocket expenses and so they can continue their insurance. But many of them can't. They can't afford it or won't. And so you'll end up with some estimates, 25 million more Americans without health coverage, health insurance, over the next few months because of the shutdown. That means that they won't be getting colonoscopies or mammograms and uh, MRIs and, and going to the doctor. And, and, and so we're going to end up with a spike of situations and probably ultimately deaths because of that. And then there's the increased mental health disorders. We know that quarantine is bad on people's mental health. Yeah. It's bad on the normal person. But then let's say you already have a pre-existing mental condition. Post-traumatic stress disorder or depression or suicidal tendencies. You know what this does? It exasperates that. There, in the United States alone, there's 232,000 232, annual deaths, more than twice what we have for COVID right now, annual deaths that have underlying mental disorder as a cause, or as a secondary cause, mental disorder. And now because of the shutdown, we are just increasing that. Back in 2008, the recession we had, along with that recession came unemployment. And it only rose about 3 or 4%. But with that, there was an equal one-to-one -one ratio. Every percent of unemployment goes up, suicide rates go up. Increased domestic violence. Since the shutdown, uh, many reports are that that has tripled, at least the reporting of these domestic violence has tripled in the last two months. And the domestic killings, murders, has doubled because of the shutdown. Personal addictions are on the rise. <laughs> I watched a seminar, no, it was a webinar on the computer um, back about a month ago, this was back in the middle of May, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the thing that uh, put this uh, seminar on, a Church Leaders Institute, and uh, they reported that porn sites are giving free membership during this shutdown, like people needed that. And also he mentioned about substance abuse on the rise during the quarantine. As well as alcohol. Well, we know here in uh, Rochester even that alcohol sales have uh, doubled. Again, this was back in the middle of May. Alcohol sales had doubled during the shutdown. So this is really good for America Health, isn't it? I say pick your poison. Shutdown or no shutdown. Health department layoffs. Yeah, because of the shutdown, the economic crunch, there will be layoffs in the health care industry. Again, going back to 2008, that minor recession we had, comparatively, 23,000 health workers were laid off because of budget cuts. They're estimating because of this economic fallout from this shutdown, that it will be more than twice that healthcare workers will be laid off. Another 45 to 50,000 healthcare workers. Now, grant maybe some of those are desk pencil pushers and they're superfluous, but you know what? A lot of them aren't. They're healthcare workers, they're healthcare people that tend to people's healthcare in our country and make sure that people are getting their visits and their appointments and caring for people from all sorts of diseases, from regular flus and getting their vaccinations and measles and chicken pox and malaria and whatever else we get. They're healthcare workers. And they're going to be gone. 
And this has also disrupted the supply chain of vital medications. Robert Arnott, who is the founder of Research Affiliates, reminded us of some of these statistics here that we have in the United States 30 million people diagnosed with heart disease, 34 million people with diabetes, 35 million that have chronic preventable lung disease, 1.8 million annually diagnosed with cancer. You're all being these, these people, and, and there is an overlap. You can't just add those all up. But if you, if you count even the overlap, because some people have cancer and diabetes or whatnot, uh, there's an estimated between 75 and 80 million people that are receiving treatment and are on strong, essential prescription medications. And now because of the shutdown, there's been an interruption in this. Some people are losing their health insurance and can't afford it now. We already talked about the millions that are going to lose their health insurance. And uh, just the disruption in the supply chain. Uh, Rob Arnott uh, suggests that between the 75 and 80 million, if you took if only one out of a hundred of those people discontinue their medication and die in the next year because of it. If only one out of a hundred, that's another 750,000 people that will die because we shut down. Even if it was only one out of 500, you're still talking 150,000 people will die because of the economic disruption to the prescription medication. Some people can't get in to see their doctors, etc. Not to mention the interruption in the world food chain. Now I say the food chain, some of you are thinking, let's see, I go from McDonald's to Taco Bell to Burger King, swing by Wegmans, uh, then over to Tops and stop at the convenience store on the way home. That's my food chain. Well, I'm talking about the international, the global world food chain. Where it begins with the farmers and people growing crops, grains, corn, meat, pork, poultry, chicken, and then the processing plants. And we know even in America here how it's been hard to find some chicken or beef and hamburger. And so these processing plants are hit, and the packaging plants, and then you got the transportation and the logistics and, and the shipping by rail or by plane or by truck or boat, and then the marketing, and finally it gets to the consumer. But that's not the food chain even I'm talking about. I'm talking about international food chain around the world. And we've already heard from our national pastors in Haiti and Ghana and Kenya. Those people live hand to mouth. Those people don't have jo salary jobs where they're collecting unemployment if they get laid off. They work for a day and they get paid a day and then they go to the market and get enough food for the day. You know what? They don't have food now. They don't have jobs. They're shut down. The world... This is the United Nations World Food Program states that by the end of the year... Because of the shutdown, not because of COVID, because of the shutdown, over 260 million people will starve to death. That's about 130 million more than normal. Think about this. Pick your poison. Uh, deaths from COVID or deaths from the shutdown? You want to die of the flu or do you want to slowly starve to death? And so the interruption... In the economy, and by the way, the United States is the key component in the world food chain. Yeah. We export more food from the United States to other countries more than any other country. In fact, the second place country is Germany, and we supply more than twice the amount of food that, that Germany does to the rest of the world. Because of the shutdown in the United States, our economic shutdown, we will be culpable. We will be responsible for the deaths of over 100 million people, starvation. We shut down and say, well, we have to do this 
Because it's loving your neighbors. How loving is that? That's not to mention the millions and millions of people who will be emaciated and starving, hungry, that may not die. They're going to live through it. Think about it. Because of the shutdown. So you say, yes, there's consequences. If you don't shut down, this is what happens. More people will die of COVID, 30 or 40,000 in the United States. Yeah, but if we do, we do shut down, look what happens. Every day there's risks. Living is risky business. And in fact, the longer you live, the greater risk you are for dying. The every day you live, the chances will increase that you're going to get old. That's a given. That you're going to get sick. And you're going to get dead. So if you don't want any risk. Well then that's death. Isn't it? So you keep on living. And you keep on having birthdays. You're increasing your danger. And your risk level. For sickness. Old age and death. And the older you get. Every year. Every year older you get. Your morbidity rate goes up. You're more apt to die. You're more susceptible. You're more vulnerable to sickness and disease and to falling accidents and getting hurt. Do you know in the United States, almost 3 million people a year die? Not because of COVID. People die. In fact, this chart we have up here starts off 100% are living. 100%. You see where they all end up? Now, this shows the difference between 1900, 1920, 1940, 1960, 1980. Do you know where we all end up? Dead. Because it's appointed unto men who wants to die. Now, most recently in our country, we've had less infant mortality and less childhood diseases. And so we live longer in our early years. But once we hit 65, the drop-off is sharper than ever. I don't mean to be pessimistic. I'm just talking reality. We all die. R living is risky business. You say, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid of COVID. Well, be afraid of dying, period. Now, we're not, as Christians, we're not afraid to die either, are we? You just got to pick your poison. 600,000, 600,000 people die annually of cancer in, our, in the United States. 170,000 people die every year in the United States from unintentional accidents. Some of those are motor vehicle accidents. About, I don't know, 34,000 of those are motor vehicle accidents. The rest are just falls, accidents at work, accidents. People die. Living is risky business. Except for the Christian. Amen. I say it's not risky business for a Christian because we got nothing to lose, so there's no risk. If we die, it's gain. We uh, go to the glory to be with Christ forever. So for us, death is living. Or dying, there's no risk involved. It's gain, gain. Amen. Amen. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So there is no losing proposition for the Christian. So, so, so let me change the subject. It's not going to pick your poison anymore. Let's just say and talk about living with risk. As a Christian, we have to live with danger. We have to live with risk. That's, that's part of living. And for the Christian, because of our lifestyle, we actually have less risk of dying. Now, we're going to all die if the Lord doesn't come back, but we have a less risk uh, of dying sooner than the other, our counterparts in the unbelieving world. Because the Christian lifestyle, for the most part, is a healthy lifestyle. Uh, we avoid drugs and alcohol, the use of tobacco products and and uh, many of those things. And, and so the Christian lifestyle in itself, we have less alcohol-related accidents and, and, and deaths and driving under the influence and those kind of things. Christians have less of those because we seek to have a godly Christian lifestyle. However, Christians have a greater risk of danger and death because we are Christians. 
Because we are a unique minority in this world, and the world hates us. Jesus said, if the world hated me, you know it's going to hate you. The world perse if they persecuted me, you know they're going to persecute you. Uh, Christians become the focus of the animosity and enmity of Satans and demons. So Christians are under great me. Not to mention, not just the fact that we're a child of God in this broken world, but because God has called us to a mission to minister and to live for Him. And as a Christian lives for God, doing His will, preaching the gospel, he becomes an additional target of hatred and animosity in this world. And by doing God's mission, if you will, obedient to God, helping people in need, you know what that's going to do? Put us even in greater risk. Because that means I'm going to have to help people in need. Maybe go into a leprosy colony. Maybe go into the inner city. Maybe pick up a stranger. Be a good Samaritan. Oh, those are dangerous. Yes, but God calls us to do those things. Maybe it means going into a disease-infested, insect, bug-infested jungle to take the gospel. Maybe it means to go as a missionary to a, a country where there's political instability and there's not good medical care and the diseases are rampant. Yes, but God called me to go. And so for the Christian, because of our association with Christ and because of our mission, we have an increased risk of dangers in this life. I want to do a biblical view of risk and danger. Encourage you to not worry about it. Because God is sovereign over the risks and dangers in His people fulfilling His purposes. Amen. God has put us here. He has purposely not raptured us instantly into heaven. He's left us here to serve, to live a life for Him. A life of glory, a life of honor. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 16, 9. He says, a great door and effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. God opened a door, an effective door of ministry for Paul. Paul says, I'm going to stay right here in Ephesus and keep ministering. Because God opened me a door. Do you know what else? There's a lot of enemies. It's dangerous. There's riots. There was a one in, in, in Ephesus when Paul was there. It's unsafe. That's all right. God's called me. God's calling us to ministry. God knows that there's dangers involved in it. He calls us anyways. Dangers and risks to Christians doesn't take God by surprise. God's work isn't thwarted. God doesn't say, oh, oh, I forgot about that. That's dangerous. I better not have my children go there. No. God does not withhold his children from dangerous mission fields and dangerous uh, uh, situations. He says, go, make disciples. He says, assemble together, my people. There's, there's risks involved. Now, some countries, there's hot spots. That are more dangerous than others, aren't there? Some lands, geographically, there's more political unrest. There's more hatred for Christians. If you're going to be a Christian and live like a Christian in a Muslim country, in a Buddhist country, in a Hindu land, in a communist country, that brings a lot more danger than living for Christ here in America. But there's dangers. There's risks involved. When we say, I'm going to live for Christ and I'm going to be a mouthpiece for God and I'm going to speak truth and proclaim the good news. But God is sovereign over that. I would have you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. And I, and I would suggest to you that I have had a wrong perspective of this so often. I focus so much on the love of God. And I missed something. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 35. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's the question. Can anything, anybody on this created earth separate us from the love of Christ? No! But see, that's what I become focused with. And I forget sometimes all the rest he says here. 
shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Oh, you know why he mentions all those things? Because those are the things that Christians often face. He faced all those. Christians in the first century faced all those things. In the first three centuries, there was terrible martyrdom of Christians. Ah, but wait. 70 million, it's estimated by missiologists, 70 million Christians have been martyred for Christ down through the centuries. 70 million. The interesting thing is that 45 million of those happened in the last century. Not in the first three centuries. Almost two-thirds of all martyrs, murders of Christians, because of their faith in Christ, happened in the last century. Animosity towards Christ has not lessened. It has increased. And I suggest to you, if you're going to stand for Christ now and in the coming years, be aware, be ready to suffer for Christ's sake. And that's why he mentions this. Tribulations, distresses, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, for God's sake, we are killed all day long. <clears throat> yeah. In the early... He's writing to the church at Rome. Nero was emperor. Persecuting, burning Christians alive. We are killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And who loved us? We're more than conquerors. In other words, God in the midst of this gives us strength to ride above all those things. We don't fear those things. We're more than conquerors. God's grace is abundant. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. We don't fear any of those things. Are Christians liable? Are we da those dangers that we could face? Absolutely. Are we going to let them worry us? No. We're more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Paul says, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, principalities, powers, things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our rejoicing and benefiting in the love of Christ for us and saving our souls, strengthening us, Nothing's going to hinder that. Are we susceptible? Are we vulnerable to suffering, tribulation, sickness, death, famine, starvation? Sure. Those things will not bother us. There's a danger. It's a reality to all believers. Not just pastors and missionaries. All believers. Jesus said, if the world hates you, it's going to hate hated me. It's going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. All these things they will do to you for my name's sake. It's not because you're a missionary, it's because you're a Christian. You're related to Jesus Christ, you're a child of God. You're marked. Paul says, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There are additional risks and dangers that come to people who preach the gospel. Yes, our national pastors and, and teachers and missionaries... They may be the particular focus and target of Satan and of the world. Paul said that in 1 Timothy. He says, whereunto I'm appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher for the Gentiles. And what? For which cause I also suffer these things. They were directly... A lot of the suffering and tribulation Paul experienced was directly related to the fact that that he's going to preach the word. If he'd have just shut his mouth up and hid over in the corner, he'd have been okay. But because he's going to fulfill his ministry, that brought on additional target. So how do we prepare for this? As Christians, we are. We are vulnerable. We are susceptible. We are at risk to danger and death. Does that bother you? hope not. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. And see here Paul's response. Acts chapter 21, beginning at verse 10. Acts 
21, verse 10. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when they heard these things, both we and those from the place, from that place, pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Remember, Luke is the author here. Luke, along with these other people there, pleaded with him, that is, pleaded with Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul said, verse 13, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready, not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, the will of the Lord be done. These people said, oh, Paul, you could, you're going to be in prison when you get there. We don't know what might happen to you. It's not safe. Don't go. Paul says, quit it, you're killing me. You're, you're worrying and fussing about my safety is causing me more grief than the thought of me going to be in prison. It's not going to stop me. I'm ready. My mind and my will are already set upon serving God. I've already made the decision to be faithful. I've already surrendered my life as a living sacrifice. My life is not my own anyways. I've already made the decision. I'm ready. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to be faithful to God. In fact, this was actually a stern rebuke of these people. It reminded me of what Jesus said when, when he told the disciples that I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer and die. And Peter said, oh no, Lord, no, no, may that never be. And what did Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Because the way of the Christian is a way of cross-bearing. It's a way of danger. And sometimes death. And when we think, oh, I'm going to have to, oh, safety first. No, that's the way the world thinks. The Christian says, faithfulness first. Faithfulness first. It's satanic if you're trying to persuade me from following the will of God because of safety matters. Go back to chapter 20 prior to this. Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. When he was leaving Ephesus, the elders of the church there beginning at verse 20, 21. Testifying to the Jews, this is what Paul had done, he testified to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That was some of his ministry. And see, he says, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. I'm going and doing what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. Going bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Well, remember... In chapter 21, they finds out what's going to happen. But here he doesn't even know. He doesn't care. Not knowing the things that are going to happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city. Saying that chains and tribulations weigh me. I guess he did know. Huh? Agabus' prophecy was just another one of those. Apparently he'd heard it in a number of towns and cities. Yeah. Chains and tribulation await me. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear unto myself. What matters to Paul? That I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Faithfulness to finish my Christian race that's what, that's what counts. I'm going to just finish my... I don't care what happens to me. If I get sick. If I get in an accident. If I have to go to Africa and I end up catching malaria and dying. Oh well. 
I'm following what God wants me to do. I'm being obedient and faithful. And I'm running the course as a Christian. And the special ministry Paul had received. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. None of these things move me. You see, the Christian's preparation is to right now, in your own heart and mind, already make the resolve. I'm ready. Surrender your life to Christ. Be Present your body a living sacrifice to God as a living sacrifice? You've already surrendered your life to Him, haven't you? What, know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the head of God, and you're not your own? You're bought with a price. It's not your life anyways. It's God's. I think He's big enough to take care of it. If He wants to bring you to glory, He will. If He wants you to get sick, He will. Faithfulness. Remember we told people in, in Revelation, be faithful unto death. That's what God wants. Not safety first, faithfulness unto death. Be ready. Hebrews 11, it talks about, yeah, the great victories that those people of faith had. And then in verse 35, it changed. And it said, others were tortured. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Not accepting deliverance. Apparently there was a way of escape. If you just quit preaching, if you quit assembling as the people of God, if you just don't, don't tell anybody about your Christ, if you just be quiet, we're going to let you go. And they said no. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Maybe they're talking about the rewards and crowns and glory. I don't know there, but, but they refuse to compromise their Christian life with the Christian message. Faithfulness unto death was what they cared about. Now Christians, mind you, are not otherwise foolish with their lives. We believe in life. We're pro-life. We believe in taking care of our health and life as much as possible. It's just not more important than doing the will of God and obeying His commands and being faithful. But we are. Christians are people who wear life vests when they're in their boat. They buckle their seatbelts. They exercise. They eat right. They have smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors in their home. They, they try to be as healthy as possible because they know that being overweight or obese, hypertension, increased diabetes, stroke, heart disease, death. We don't want those. That's foolish. And so Christians do avoid the risk of death in those areas that they have control over. But when it comes to simply obeying God and being faithful, our lives are not important to us. Faithfulness and obedience to Christ is what matters. <laughs> On my tombstone, it might be said he led a safe life, he stayed in his house. No. <laughs> God forbid. You know, it, it could say that, and he's still dead, isn't he? <laughs> No. I want it to be known that he was here and God saved him and he gave his life to Christ and none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. To live as Christ and to die as gain. He's given me an abundant life not to stay home in fear but to live life to the fullest and for His glory. When He called us to be His disciples, He said, take up your cross. You know what that meant? Get a nice gold piece of jewelry and put on your neck. You know, to bear your cross meant just like Jesus. Some people think, oh, the cross bearing, that's just some little burden you have to bear in life. You got an ogre of a husband. You got a, 
a lousy job and you got to put up with that. No, that's not cross-bearing. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. To take up that cross and carry it to the Golgotha and give his life in the most shameful, most painful death possible. And Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, you got to be willing. you got to surrender your life. That's total surrender. Total self-denial. Faithfulness first, not safety first. And then he said, whoever desires to save his life. We've heard an awful lot in the last few months about saving lives. Jesus says, if you want to save your life, you lose it for my sake. Back in 1886, in Northfield, Massachusetts, I used to go to camp up in Northfield, Massachusetts. It was a great revival at that time, and it started off with 100 students, and they dedicated their lives to serve the Lord, what became known as the Student Volunteer Movement. Over the next 20 years, or next 40 years, 20,000 people dedicated their lives and went into full-time missionary service. A great movement. In fact, at one point, one out of every 37 college students in the United States left to go into the foreign mission field. Of course, back in the late 1800s, most colleges were Bible colleges. Harvard, Yale, Baylor, those were all Baptist institutions of higher learning, seminaries. So there was a great, great movement, and, and it caught on, not just the students, but other young men and women. But you know what they did? When they got ready to go, they packed their belongings in a coffin to be shipped overseas. Because they said, we're not coming back. I'm going on a mission to tell people about Christ. These lands were remote and dangerous and risky. God had called them to serve. And they'd already surrendered their life to Him. And they said, when I come back, it'll probably be in this coffin. They would also leave a letter with their pastor or with the mission agency one young lady wrote this, left with her pastor, Dear Pastor, you should only be opening this letter in the event of my death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I've tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place, I was called to Him, to Christ. And to obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory is my reward. The missionary heart cares more than some people think is wise. And it risks more than some people think is safe. It dreams more than some think is practical. It expects more than some think is possible. I was not called to comfort or to success, but to obedience. There is no joy outside of knowing Jesus and serving Him. The truth is that obediently following the Lord is dangerous. Not just going to a foreign mission field. Just to put your life on the line day after day after day and obey his commands will bring risk. And I can foresee down here in America even, the land of the free and home of the brave, persecution is coming to Christians. Mm-hmm. I hope you're resolved, faithful first. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for the clarity of it. That safety first is not our model. It's faithfulness first. To any task or any command you give us. So Lord, when we're allowed to reopen churches, I just pray that faith and faithfulness would prevail among your people. We'll be careful to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.